We're on. We are now recording. The Senior Citizen Commission meeting for Thursday uh, is called to order at 2.31 p.m. Uh, I'm Jim Daniel, Carol Gatham here, and I co-chair the commission and take turns presiding at meetings. Today it's my turn again. Uh, as usual, we'll continue to follow our standard procedure. I'll announce each agenda item, provide direction on motions, and so on after the presentation. Uh, I'll invite the speaker to begin. Afterwards, commissioners can ask any technical questions that require clarification, but we must allow for public comment before engaging in discussion. Uh, first item is to, uh, the roll call, so uh, please respond uh, present or here if you're here, and don't say anything if you're not here. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is it, is it Budenhagen or Hagen? It's Hagen, okay. Like ice cream. Yeah, yeah all right. Budenhagen. Here. Uh, Cole. Here. Garberson. Gavin. Here. Lasinski. Here. Miller. Here. Daniel is here. Hobart. Here. And council member Vitele uh, is not here yet. <coughs> and of course, staff Maria and Janet. Uh, yes. Janet. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, <coughs> the next item is approval of the agenda. And uh, <coughs> Maria and I suggest that since council member Vitla has to lead by three, that we, and he wants to give some viewpoint and uh, comments on the work plan uh, for the commission, that we move that to the earliest when he's here, <laughs> earliest when he's here, and allow him to do that, and then commission members have any comments to him or reactions to that and then rather than continuing on the work plan we'll go back to the regular order of the agenda as uh, printed and come back to the work plan when we get to it. Uh, are there any objections to that modification? No. Would somebody move approval of the agenda as modified? I so move. Second. Thank you. Who is second to that? Ron, Ron, I think. Uh, <clears throat> all in favor say aye. 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 Oppose nay. Any abstentions? No abstentions. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. And there we go. Hey. 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 And I'll say, and Garberson? Here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, perfect timing, Tom, because next is brief announcements from staff, uh, staff's commissioners and liaisons. I want to start off with an announcement that this is your last meeting. Uh, you've been a commissioner since 2016. On behalf of the commission and the senior citizens of Davis, I thank you, Tom, for your service since 2016. Your many contributions, your energy, your time, your thoughtful ideas and comments. You've helped improve the lives of Davis senior citizens. Uh, thanks again for your exceptional service, and let's give Tom a hand. Yeah. Thank you all. We will miss you, though. I miss you all, too. I, I hope you stay in touch somehow. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'll still be getting the emails and have <laughs> <laughs> a chance to drop by. Well, you know, I live in Rancho Yellow, so stop by any time. Sounds good. Okay. And it could well be that your name appears on the city website for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> before, it gets, before it gets updated. Uh, are there any other announcements from commissioners? Is this where I should mention what we're doing in Rancho Yellow, or should I wait further? Oh, it is certainly under brief announcements. It's appropriate. Okay. Um, I, I don't know whether you all care. I just thought I would mention, <laughs> and you, you can tell me whether this, this is not appropriate or whatever. Some of the things that we are doing in Rancho Yellow that are, are programs that um, you, you might or might not have interest in, but seniors do. Uh, on Saturday uh, at 10 in the morning, we are having a talk a discussion between a retired lawyer and a retired physician on end-of-life decisions 
and um, they are going to look at, at the issues from both a, a medical and a legal point of view, and uh, they will have a discussion, and then uh, attendees can ask questions. Um, we may or may not have um, the uh, son and daughter-in-law of somebody who recently passed away in Rancho Yolo who decided to do, um, well, I, I don't know what you call it because it's not called physician-assisted suicide anymore, but, um, but with medical help, she chose to end her, her life. And so uh, we're hoping that they come to talk about what it was like as the family to go through this process, and then how are they coping afterwards? Bless you. So that is one thing. On um, Tuesday, June 27th, and Wednesday, June 28th, we are having a, uh, a mini fair at Rancho Yellow in our breezeway uh, of emergency preparation. So we're having a uh, some uh, the Yellow County uh, Emergen Office of Emergency Services will come and they will help people uh, load the yellow alerts onto their phones. Um, we will have um, uh, Yellow Healthy Aging Alliance is going to have a hand out some information brochures and some small kits, uh, emergency grab kits. Um, uh, resources for independent living is coming with also some other checklists and other materials and um, and I'm hoping by then they have some new uh, yeah. new backpacks um, they have excellent excellent emergency backpacks that um, they have um, great um, resources in them of things that you don't normally get um, they're waiting for more funding and, and to see if they can get more supplies. But we're hoping that they have them. Uh, who else is coming? Uh, oh, Air Resources Board coming to talk about um, air quality. Uh, how appropriate. And we set this up long before the, the Canada thing. So um, you're welcome to attend any of those functions. Um, I don't know what to say, and I guess every month I will try to, if, if this is helpful to you, I will let you know what's going on in Rancho Yellow, and if you have people who want to attend, just kind of let me know. So if I uh, need to put out more chairs or something, but. How's the parking situation? Huh? Well, it's it's not great, but uh, we do have a parking lot, um, and you cannot park on the street, but you can park in the lot. Uh, so we do kind of want to know how many people are, are coming from outside. But yeah, thank you. <coughs> so that's what's going on. And yesterday I heard a presentation by, I think it's Emily, I think Emily Yu, but anyway, the young woman who was an intern at Yolo Healthy Aging Alliance and oh. who put together that material that you're talking about. Well, she only put together the ranch, the, their part, because right. the other, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I know, but, uh, but the, and, uh, she's well. I'm, I'm going to be sent uh, some information that they prepared, and uh, I'll see about getting on the website under resources. Okay, perfect. Because we also have Yellow Healthy Aging Alliance. Through them, we have a food truck that comes once a month, and um, it's coming this coming Monday. You have to reserve a meal ahead of time, but it's free. Um, they're happy to take donations, but. Um, Anyone in Rancho Yellow can sign up for a free dinner and then you get a small second meal for next day lunch. Um, so that is something else they provide. Um, just kind of, what else you might want to know? Always a lot going on. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and, you. Yeah. Thank you very much for letting us know about sure. those things. That's, uh, I think that's helpful. Are there any other announcements, brief announcements from commissioners or staff? I have a brief announcement, which is I'd like to introduce Sandy Alvarez White. She is our new program coordinator here at the Senior Center. That was a vacant position that was just filled, and you've been here. This will be your second week. 
on the job. She's doing a wonderful job. She transferred from working with unhoused communities, uh, first through PD and then through the new uh, agency under, under uh, the direction of uh, Dana Bailey. So she comes with a uh, wealth of resources and had done a wonderful job intervening and being a mediator uh, for us here at the Senior Center when we had some challenging folks um, that needed a little bit of guidance. And so, um, Sandy, anything you'd like to yeah. add? Oh, um, well, thank you all for welcoming me for a minute. Um, just want to say thank you, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited about, you know, my new adventure, my new everything that, you know, planning for the future here. And I'm just excited to be here, so thank you, you for giving me this. I would like to hear a little bit more about what you you have in mind for programs. Oh, or if that's so, way. we're starting with we're starting with kind of a thorough assessment of all the participants who are here and their interests and likes. And so we start with the getting to know you. And so she's created a survey template, and she's yes. going around now meeting each and every single activity group, uh, wellness class, folks that drop in, uh, folks that, yes, yes, here at the senior, specific yes. to the senior center. And we're starting with that because really we're public servants and we're here to listen. So we want to know what people want. And yes. so it starts with that. Um, she's also doing some kind of administration background stuff. So we have activities that are drop-in that we don't necessarily always have a sign-in for, like our men's group has maybe uh, from a dozen to 20 people. Um, but she's kind of formalizing kind of a sign-in so we can really get accurate numbers rather than just estimates on who's here on a daily basis. I can say generally 150 are here, but you know, more specifically depending on the day, depending on the right. on the month and the and so keep forth. Track and see yeah, so the, the tracking that she's also just working on just broader program planning. We have had um, feedback in the past about like cooking demonstrations and the yeah. lunch and learn. And we want to tie in the meal program that we hope to have back in September, the Meals on Wheels. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, so basically that's it and so much more. But right now she's just kind of getting acclimated and absorbing all of this new information. I think this would be perfect to even start like a tamale, get everybody to get no, <laughs> <laughs> You know, get all these hands to No, but it, it's, it's, it's exciting to, you know, plan all these new things and new demos and new activities and, for me, it's exciting, so I'm excited about it to, to get people excited and, and look forward to some fun stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. We're happy that, happy that you're here, and I'm sure Maria's happy no longer to be doing two jobs for one time. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll hear progress reports from Sandy, so okay. we'll see her again. Yeah. I know we're a little Great. pressed for time today, but yeah. Yes, thank you guys for I have a brief statement. Um, I just wanted to piggyback back on what Elizabeth said in regards to um, this Saturday event. Can you speak up a little bit? Sure. I just wanted to say that in regards to the event that Rancho Yellow is having this Saturday, it's a very important event. But I would like for us to plan a forum to invite more seniors along with that topic, um, medical directives, reasonable accommodation, and because um, the letter from the, that we received the email from the gentleman about Ace Hardware, I think if he had said, if I can, uh, as a reasonable accommodation, I need to use the restroom, that takes it to a whole nother area as opposed to, I need to use your restroom. So I can see why he would say that from a disability perspective, and I can see why the uh, new owner would decline, you know. And so, um, but that was, I was uh, going to talk to you about that later. But there are things that I think seniors need to be made aware of so that they can really be advocating for themselves. And I'll touch on that a, a little bit more because there are some things that disabled people share with seniors, but not all seniors are disabled. And, and disability is very wide. It can be a temporary disability or it can be a permanent disability. And no two disabilities are the same either. You know, everyone's disability is a little unique to them. So, uh, but I would like to see us have a large form 
and bring these topics together and uh, perhaps do um, some... Um, an outreach effort. An outreach effort, an outreach effort to wealthy donors, because they do exist in the Bay Area. Okay. And I think that brings us to uh, public comment. Uh, <clears throat> is there any uh, in-person comment from public? So we had those two. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So now to you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so Robert Thayer um, emailed the Senior Citizen Commission um, expressing frustration that the restroom had been uh, rend rendered unusable and the, the business uh, stated it was because of plumbing issues and so we do have to be very careful of being a private business you know weighing in as a commission on that so um, I did reach out to him and ask him to just you know kind of just again verify because I didn't know the timeline and so on and that it had only happened in the last month or so so I'm following up with him and with um, any relevant staff that can maybe as you said um, if there's a ADA accessibility issue or something broader than just um, an out-of-commission short-term um, broken restroom so um, we are following up on that and the other public comment was from Sandy Philby and that was relating to resources for autism and um, Commissioner Veit, our council member Veitla responded to her and I did as well our program coordinator here for um, inclusion and adaptive recreation had uh, multiple referrals um, Mr. Vaitla, or Commissioner Vaitla, or Council Member Vaitla, <laughs> he's okay, like eventually. Council Member Vaitla uh, noted the ultra regional, and then there's also a neurodivergent support group. So I referred to that, and then further, I said too, if she thinks that there might be interest in forming a support group, a meetup here for um, for seniors uh, who are grandparents who are raising or supporting raising, that we would be we would be pleased to host that, and um, we want to work with a with an agency, of course, um, like Alta, uh, but but that we would be we would be open to that. So she just kind of thanked me for that for that, but um, I haven't heard any more since. So. And some one thing you said in there reminded me that uh, okay. <coughs> the uh, the area agency for that had a workshop on. Uh, aging caregivers of developmentally and intellectually yeah, uh, right. disabled and they that was in Davis and they're going to do three more in the other cities. And I haven't, that's a great, I'm going to follow up with her on yeah, that. Yeah, uh, really and also yeah. on the um, commission, the Yolo County Commission, there's a subcommittee devoted to that. They're the ones who organized it. Right. So we could make that connection. Excellent. Now that you're uh, yeah. for that. Yeah. Right. Right. Excellent. Thank it's you. It's a very active group. Well, um, good, good. good. Yeah. I know we have residents who are taking care of children and grandchildren who are, yeah. right. whatever the term is. Development of communities. Yeah, yeah. Right. And the uh, records show that the <coughs> council liaison, Dr. Weidler, is here, and we have. Uh, made a quick modification in the agenda to say that when you arrived, if you would like to uh, share your comments and viewpoint on the work plan uh, and any interaction or reaction that the commissioners have with you to that, and then we'll go back to the regular order uh, sure. and get back to the work plan when we come to it. So if you'd like to go Sure, ahead. yeah, I can stay until um, 3.30, so I don't know if Leilani, I saw okay. Leilani outside, I know she wanted to be part of this discussion, so happy to wait or to just jump in either way. I think since you can stay, let's wait okay. until Leilani comes back, if that's all right. And Council Member Reitla, thank you again for, we were just talking about the correspondence that we received um, to the commission from um, Robert Thayer and then um, Sandy Philby, and, and thank you for responding to her, and then we just added some additional resources that um, we'll refer her to. Agency on Aging Area 4, having a forum for um, older adults who are, is it co-raising, co-parenting, Jim? But they're having some educational seminars, and, um, and then Lisa had mentioned um, an additional resource, so. We'll, we'll follow up with her again. Great. Actually, what those forums were, were for uh, <coughs> people to hear from uh, the caregivers. Oh, okay. And find out what their issues are. Okay. Were. 
and I think it was uh, I think they said there were 45 people something wow. like that that attended the one day. Okay, and there's two more, three more steps. Three more. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, and actually, I said the agency. Actually, it is the the uh, Yolo Commission that was. Oh, okay. That, that organized. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, so the next item is the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are con considered routine and non-controversial, require no discussion, and are expected to have unanimous support. The consent calendar will be enacted by one motion. Commissioners may request items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. The only item on the consent calendar is the commission minutes from March 9th. Uh, <coughs> Does uh, anyone have any objection to proceeding with that? Are, are there, is, uh, well, so next is the commission minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Or, sorry, first, are there any corrections or additions? Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second? Is there uh, a second? second. No. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Any abstentions? None. All right. Uh, so that gets us to uh, item 6A and our regular items, and that's a pre presentation by Leading Age California. And I don't know, Maria, will you again uh, introduce yes. our presenter? Absolutely. And so this is um, this Harrison, who is um, representing Leading Age, and I'll just uh, read directly from the agenda. So organization, this uh, is an organization which advocates for quality nonprofit senior living and care. The organization was suggested by commissioners as a presenter when discussing affordability of housing for seniors. I think it was back in January. This organization represent, represents operators and commissioners agreed it was appropriate to consider multiple perspectives when learning more about this topic. And let me just show you how. Um, and Har Harrison, one thing I'll say, yeah. if Leilani comes back in, we may unfortunately interrupt you so that we can <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. talk a little bit about the work plan and then go right back to you. Okay, sure. And Harrison, the mouse just basically moves forward like that. Okay, I can do that. All right. Sure. So, thank you everyone for welcoming me here. Uh, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Harrison Lindner, the Assistant Director of Housing Policy for Leading Age California. Uh, Leading Age California, we are an association representing nonprofit providers of elder care and services. All right, so now let me interrupt you. Uh, Leilani, we have decided we would wait for your return and then. So sorry. And then. <laughs> uh, go to uh, <laughs> by, uh, uh, my apologies. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry Harris, but thank you for being understanding. Yeah. My my dog is in the emergency, and I I had to I wasn't able to talk to the vet before, so my apologies. Aww, so sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I will speak to just what I think a couple of questions are, but then open it up for those questions. So I think. The, the major question that was conveyed to me was whether the work plan should adapt to either the council goals or the commission restructuring process. The commission restructuring process is Josh Chapman and I are basically the subcommittee to think about how, how are things functioning, uh, what's not working well, what's working well, are there restructuring changes that we need to make. Uh, the nature of those changes is there's no parameters, basically. there's no goals. Uh, other than just improving the function of the commissions. Um, the top line message that I want to deliver is that I don't think you should wait for either the retreat or the restructuring process to finish to do your work plan. For the reason that the council goals retreat is not likely to happen before October, it's targeting. And the restructuring process is, uh, you know, the first step is to talk to chairs, vice chairs, other commissioners, to talk to staff, um, and just do a deep dive into the question about what's working and what's not. We don't anticipate coming back to council with even preliminary recommendations before September. Um, and then after that, it'll still be working with commissions to figure out what, what works, and uh, I, I would guess a few council discussions. Um, that's the top line message. The, what I would say just in terms of um, kind of illuminating the purpose restructuring beyond the general statement of improving commission functioning 
is, I think, on one side, and may not apply to the Senior Citizens Commission, which I haven't, um, you know, before I was a liaison, I'm not familiar with a lot of your activities, but um, A, I think that there are a lot of commissioners that feel that they're not being influential in the policy process, that they're, it's not clear how their voice factors into the thinking of city council members, what policy issues get prioritized, where the energy gets put in. Um, on the other hand, the, the flip side of the equation is, again, for not every commission, but at least for some commissions, I think city council, and in some cases staff, um, feels that, well, I, I would just put this on city council, I wouldn't put it on staff, but is that um, we're not getting great uh, outputs from commissions. Outputs are not either uh, the policy issues that we feel are priorities or the quality of the output is not helping us make policy. So I think there's issues on both sides. I think that the um, hopeful outcome of this is that we simultaneously manage to increase in very, uh, very, what's the word, precise terms, how commissions influence policy. Like commissioners understand very clearly that they are being influential and how they're being influential on one end. And on the other end, that commissions are working on issues that city council has prioritized. That won't be necessarily the only agenda items that come up, but for you to have an assurance that you're taking up an item that's been requested by city council for the purpose of that informing our thinking. And I think what's happening with a lot of commissions now is that city council has not been great about making those requests. Um, has not been great about saying this is our priority. Can you, uh, would you consider forming a subcommittee to do this or discuss with the full commission this? Because we were trying to choose between option A or option B. We haven't been good at doing that. And as a result, often agendas are more loaded with what I would say are informational or educational items than they are with these are policy questions that we really need your input on. Informational and educational items are great, but I, at least personally, I feel like the balance is off. And the consequences, um, the reason we embarked on this is it's, we have so many assets in our community. Just, that's, I think, our greatest resource is the skills and knowledge that people have, and it just doesn't feel like we're using it. That's, you know, that's one thing. The other issue is that staff devotes a tremendous amount of time to commissions. So if there's a track in which staff is devoting time to policy issues that are not on the front burner for council, it's tough. Because that means they have less time for stuff that is on the front burner. So that's, that's the overall purpose of what we're trying to do. But please feel free to ask questions. I can answer, at least for myself, and maybe in some cases, because I know what Josh is thinking is for the subcommittee. Commissioners have questions? Uh, I do. So as our council liaison, uh, how, how do you anticipate um, conveying what are the priority policy issues to us as we proceed with our uh, work plan? What will, that, for, for me, I, I speak for myself only, because Josh hasn't, you know, but um, for me the idea would be city council, either in the public meetings, including the retreat, um, or in subcommittees, which have already been established, say that this is something, this particular, to research this topic or to do community outreach on this topic. By the way, and I'll say that those, for me, are the two most valuable ways in which uh, commissions plug in to city council thinking in a kind of systematic way. There's other roles that come up now and then, but overall, you know, doing background research on what works, what doesn't, what are other cities doing, what are best practices, um, how do we understand the proposed solutions for a specific problem is one group of, I think, contributions. The other group is reaching out to the community and figuring out what different groups, particularly vulnerable groups or those that we don't hear from in city council, uh, need and want from city council, from the city in general. Um, but to answer your question, Elizabeth, I think so those, those discussions have, they take place on city council and subcommittees, and then what I'd like us to do is to say, 
can we ask Senior Citizens Commission to research this? Can we ask Senior Citizens Commission to take the lead in doing community outreach on this issue? You know, there's a specific question, there's a specific task, and then me as liaison uh, comes back, or in a certain case, maybe there's a particular subcommittee. Like right now, I'll just use this as an example, and I think this is a very, for me, it's a very important topic that I would love to see agendized, actually, if the commission is willing. But um, in the wake of the tragedy that just happened, uh, there's been a subcommittee formed, Glory and I, to think about what we can learn from it, in any, any, right, like mental health, and unhoused issues. But I think one of the directions in which we're thinking is, how do we expand and strengthen a volunteer network that's um, reaching out to people in need? And for me, a really important group is aging adults, and a really important issue is loneliness. It's isolation and loneliness. So it's not you know, directly tied to the tragedy itself, but I think there is something about, there are people out there who are hurting, uh, you know, suffering in different ways, and I think we as a city with all these resources should be able to create a volunteer network to figure out those needs and then uh, create policies uh, to support that volunteer network. But I just use that as an example of where a subcommittee, you know, Gloria and I haven't talked about aging adults yet, but we might come to a point where we ask you to do something like, um, what is the mental health what do we know about mental health about, of aging adults in the community right now? Yeah. Yeah. And if we don't know much, that's a useful conclusion. And then we might say something like, what are best practices in accompanying um, aging adults who've lost their loved ones and feel alone? You know, that might be a question. So I think that's how the questions would come up for tasks. And that's an example of the reason. I, so that's an example where it might not be your liaison. In this case, I'm a liaison and I'm a subcommittee, but it might be that a subcommittee Concern with a particular issue would reach out to you. Tom had had his hand up earlier, right? Elizabeth covered my question. <laughs> Sorry. I have a question. Um, as a researcher, that word means so many different things. Yeah. And so it's useful to have some indication of the scope or the type or the depth, uh, right. you know, of what that means. Right. We have talked about looking into the community here and trying to find out what's going on. We've talked about that a lot. We're, we're trying to figure out what are our tools? Yeah. Can we survey? Yeah. Can we use Qualtrics? Of course, that excludes a large portion, a lot of older adults in particular, but that's no question. Yeah. Um, or mailing things. Do we have that kind of a resource? Or is it really through volunteers, which is hit or miss in a lot of ways? Yeah. And it's yeah. usually these folks here who ha are the haves and not the have-nots yeah. that we have ties to. Yeah. So we perpetuate sometimes yeah. right, the problem yeah. when we rely on technology to do it sure. because we're excluding you know, yeah. a lot of older adults and low-income older adults and people that we know. So I'm just Great, great question. No, a great okay. question. So we should work on that? <laughs> no, no, a great question. And as you know, and you know, I come from academic background too, as you know, uh, the methodology is tied to the question. And, but what I do think is that um, we, uh, if the methodology does not meet a certain standard of rigor, the conclusions are useless, effectively, right? Yeah. So I think it would be um, an iterative process where you say, if you really want to answer this question, you're going to need to do a survey. And then it's up to city council to go to staff, city council to discuss, okay. are we willing to put resources towards answering that question and doing right. the survey the way it needs to be done. Good. Any other uh, comments or reactions to uh, uh, Councilman, uh, are you suggesting that we proceed today and in the subsequent meetings with our work plan as, we, as yes. we're working on it, but stand ready to make maybe significant revisions to that as we get more feedback from your process of your committee and your retreat, setting some specific goals that you would like us to work on and, and, and letting us know those and we'll modify our plan in six months or whenever that, that happens. Yes, that's what I would say. I would say don't, I wouldn't stop the work plan process because I think we have a lot of issues to talk about um, and what the rough calendar that Josh and I would like to meet is end of the calendar year. Their council has decided if we're going, if we do anything, the things that we'll do before commissions. 
And I would say that, again, it's not like we want 100% of the work to be just in response to council. But, and, and again, not speaking of this commission in particular, but a higher percentage uh, than what's happening now in most commissions. And again, I think it's a question of morale, too. Because as much as people value the freedom of being able to choose what their commission does, what I've heard is that just as important or even more important is feeling that you're actually making a difference in city policy. I have a question. I think Carol and I are scheduled for a Zoom session with you on that matter. Well, so all I knew about it is we're having a Zoom session on, on restructuring, or uh, that's not the term you use. Uh, that is the term I use, but yeah. I don't even but know anyway, if that's the yeah, sure. correct. Yeah. Will we get some information in advance about what you'd like to know? <laughs> <laughs> we can, if you want, but I think the questions I asked here, the, the highest level questions are what's working and what's not. How is morale? Do you feel like you're making a difference? Do you feel like the energy level, the commitment level of the commission is like this, or is it constant? If it's up and down, what explains the down periods? How is your relationship with staff? How is your relationship with city council? Those are the high level questions, and then we'll get into the details depending on your answers. Okay, okay. that'll help us, I'm sure. Yeah, Tom. Um, so it, you sort of talked about essentially the two directions of flow of information, the council request to commissions, commission, you know, influence with city council or impact. Um, I guess, and I think we've talked more about the council request to the commissions. In terms of commission impact with council and making a difference, yeah. um, I've always kind of viewed our role as twofold. One is obviously we're an advisory yeah. commission to council, but we're also an advocate for the senior community. Um, what should the process look like? And maybe this is a question you can answer now, maybe it's after yeah. you've gone through this process. Yeah. But what should the process look like if we want to convince council that there is a serious issue yeah. for the yeah. senior community? Or even more controversially, what the, the action council has taken is not what you agree with right, as a body. This is a very um, important debate. Is your on paper your role is advisory, right? And traditionally, you know, an advisory body responds to requests of the body they're advising, um, and you you don't necessarily think of it as an advocacy organization. Um, but the truth is in Davis that uh, commissions have been advocates, and I think. The strict answer to your question differs personally from council member to council member. Some council members, I'm not even speaking of this particular council, I'm just thinking like generally, are, are like, you're an advisory body, I don't want to hear criticism from you actually, There's, that's, this is what you do, you're here to advise. And then there are other council members who will say that we don't know what we don't know, so in your example, issues that we're not even, are not even on our radar, we're looking for you to bring it up and sometimes strive in. Um, and then I would say, you know, um, there are have been instances where the critique, very recently actually, there's criticism where the critique is very pointed. Um, and then some commissions, you know, most, I would say the majority of council members recoil at very pointed public critique, you know. But again, should they? That's an open question. And I think, I can speak to my personal feelings about this. I, I think that's, these are issues that, we discuss as a subcommittee and then lay out guidelines. You know, my, I, do you want to hear my personal feelings about this? Or is I'd love to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my personal feelings about this is that um, critique with an eye towards feasible options, you know, which I think, you know, there's. Um, I've lost a couple of, already in my short time, I've lost a couple of votes for one, three, one, right? And I kind of knew going in that was the likely outcome. Um, my hope, and I, I, don't even, I don't know if it worked out this way, but my hope is that um, even in opposition to council, there was some productive movement forward on the ideas, you know? Like say the U-Mall, you know? Okay, but for neighborhood shopping centers, do we want to create new redevelopment zoning standards? You know, 
So that kind of thing is, from my personal perspective, I think there's a lot of room for advocacy and critique. But I would say that critique is not gratuitous. It's not for the sake of making yourself feel some like moral warm glow or something. It's actually there's an eye towards these are the constraints that staff is facing. These are the constraints that city council is facing. We as a commission has, have discussed those constraints in an empathetic manner before we make a motion that's critical of council. And if it's heavily critical, you know, then I would also say you might want to talk to the liaison or city council members uh, before you go public with that critique. And you may you certainly want to talk with staff. Because you know, in some cases it might be counterproductive where there's people and just council members are human, everyone's human, a pointed critique might take you from defense to being really defensive and shutting down. That's not what we should be doing, but sometimes that happens, right? No, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or I'd like, to say, I'd like to say something. I think that this is a really promising um, project, and I'm um, really glad that you and um, Josh Chapman are working on it. And I, I mean, one, um, I am thinking a, a little bit about the the larger context of the commission, of our commission here, and. I think that it's really a, a, a good thing that you're going to have a direct line of communication with our chair and vice chair. Um, and also, I'm aware that there's different generations and lengths of time with the commission that um, different commissioners have sat. And so I'm hoping that there's a way that you can try to um, get a larger uh, picture that yeah. can capture, um, um, you know, a, I don't know, more a longer timeline yeah. um, of observations yeah. um, is one recommendation. Um, and then, because um, I think both um, Jim Daniels and Carol Gavin are, are both very I think, blessed in a year you guys have been um, on the commission. Uh, and then also, um, I'm wondering if you'll, in addition to the type of direct feedback and guided questions that your conversations are going to be having, there be any kind of attempt to do an organizational analysis or like an organizational psychology mm -hmm. kind of analysis about workplace dynamics, the way that different types of communication um, um, have might signal or impact workplace. The, the, if we think about the commission functioning like a work group, for example, then there are dynamics that can take place that are beyond simply the, what's articulated in city goals and um, objectives and what's articulated in our work plan, for example, that impact our work together. Yeah, great comments. Um, I think, you know, in response to the first point, um, Josh and I would like to figure out what's the most efficient, because there's so many commissioners, right? So what's the most efficient way of getting feedback from those who are not currently chair or vice chair? Um, and I think we'll almost certainly do something like it matter. I, I don't want to say almost certainly because I don't want to speak for Josh, but um, you know, survey is something that's out there easily done. Um, and also, I think giving um, commissioners a chance to contact us. You know, um, if we're just you know, if it's like ten, only ten commissioners, you know, out of the uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, you know, uh, probably yeah, you know, so fourteen commissions. You know, almost 100 commissioners probably. Um, if 50 of them want, to, then it's a problem. You know? But if only 15, 20, then we can schedule interviews. Uh, we haven't decided, but I, I think it's a great point about just because you're not chair or vice chair now doesn't mean you don't have a kind of unique perspective there. So we'll, we'll try to capture this. Um, I think your second point is really important too, in the sense that we're also going to contact staff. And we're really talking to you about your own um, perceptions of what's working and what's not. Um, and I haven't thought about it in terms of organizational psychology terms, but I think um, this is what we're getting at, not just why aren't commissions working or not working, but why isn't the city structure 
around the commissions, optimizing the value of the commissions as well. So it's a good point. Um, I think I don't really know much about organizational psychology, but uh, it's something I think I'm going to look into a little bit and see if there's kind of a standardized set of questions we can start with to ask about those relationships. To those Anything else? Anything? Well, thank you sure. very much for, well, for your work and as a liaison to this commission and specifically for coming and giving us some ideas about how to proceed with the work. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yep. And there are some, <laughs> now I'll get back to you. <laughs> now, I don't think we've forgotten who you are. <laughs> So we'll return to the work plan portion of the conversation afterwards. We'll return. Oh, yeah. No, to yeah, we're coming back to the work plan. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we would then return to the agenda in, order, in the regular order. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like I was mentioning, we in California, we're an association representing nonprofit providers of elder care and services across the aging care continuum. So that might start in senior affordable housing, um, go to maybe assisted living or skilled nursing facility, um, home and community-based services, anything in that range, we, we have members that do that. Um, it gives us a unique perspective as opposed to maybe an association that only has members that provide affordable housing or just maybe um, assisted living or just skilled nursing. Uh, we understand how they're connected, which helps us understand how the policies affect each other. So on the housing policy team, I'm, uh, ah, here we go. I'm not sure if you can see this, but um, yeah, it's not big enough. But anyway, I, my, my boss is Megan Rose. She's the general counsel and chief government affairs officer at a leading age California. And she's been doing uh, housing policy work for a very long time. I'm much more new to it, but uh, it's very interesting to work stuff, so I've learned a lot recently. Uh, we also have a contract lobbyist that helps us out with any sort of affordable housing related bills, who is also on our housing policy. There's, you can probably make it a little bigger if you were to go full screen. Yeah, let's see. Where is the. It's that little. Lower right. Ah, uh, presentation. Those over 55 
were accessing homelessness services um, at, and there were 85% more of them over that period. And for those over 65, it increased 140%. So, yes, significant growth. Um, and that is, at least for the 65 and older number, that's more than three times the overall increases. So older adults are getting hit by, as, you know, as I see it, the housing unaffordability crisis in California harder than any other groups. So it's generally agreed by experts that look at the homelessness issue, particularly in California, that what really drives homelessness in California, what sets us apart from other states where you see not nearly the same level of increases in the homelessness population is housing costs. Housing costs in California have increased tremendously. They've increased across the United States, but nowhere worse than California, at least overall as a state. And when housing costs increase, renters, particularly those on limited incomes, for example, like fixed incomes, like if you, for example, maybe only have social security, or maybe if you rely on supplemental security income, or something like that, you're seeing your housing costs outpace your, um, your income faster than pretty much anyone. Wages have not kept up with housing costs, but what's kept up, what's gotten, what's increased even slower than that, is things like SSI and Social Security. So it's not very uncommon to see cases where there's been someone living in an apartment for decades, and then eventually the rent increases high enough that they simply cannot pay it. And if they do not have the support systems in place to make sure that they are cared for, when that happens, then they likely end up um, homeless, which is very sad and unfortunate. Yeah, so the plurality of uh, American retirees, they rely exclusively on uh, social security income. Around 40% of retirees in the United States rely only on social security income. Typically speaking, most experts say that that is, most, most uh, retirement planners rather would say that that is far from ideal. Typically, um, a retirement planner tells you you should you should hopefully have like 70 to 80 percent of pre-retirement uh, income when you retire. Social Security typically only covers maybe 40 percent of that, so around half as much as you would hope to have. So it makes for a very precarious situation. And as time has gone on, um, uh, older adults, as as people age, the the numbers for savings and um, rent burden, all those things have just been going up. It's, a, it's an unfortunate trajectory. So, if you click over into the side panel, you should be able to move through the slides. Um, yeah, well, 
So yeah, so statistics suggest that older adults are being outpriced out of their homes at an unconscionably high rate. And without action, California will continue to see drastic growth in the number of older adults becoming unhoused or housing insecure. So what is there to do about it? So um, whether the progress is enough is a question worth asking, but there is progress. So we'll start, I'm gonna start by talking about what happened last year. Last year, um, you know, the state had a lot of money um, and there wasn't so much of fear of spending it. Um, similar to the federal government, when the economy is good, the state gets a lot more income from tax revenue and things like that, and they feel more comfortable. Uh, legislators, as well as the governor, feels uh, more comfortable spending. Last year was a good year in terms of that. And they spent, uh, I think, near record amount on housing. They spent around $20 billion in investment in affordable housing, uh, some of that senior housing. This year, it's going to be a lot less, but the economy does not look nearly as rosy, and we at Lean Age California are more working to make sure that programs are not cut, as well as, as instead of looking to see what new programs can be <coughs> built up and what new investment can be put in. Um, something, some other things that happened in the state last year is there was community care expansion, um, which is, uh, frankly, we, we don't view this as the, the best solution. Basically, it, uh, as you may know, um, Medicare and Medicaid do not necessarily cover um, assisted living, with, and there's a, a big issue for uh, low-income older adults is being uh, prematurely put in skilled nursing. Um, community care expansion, basically um, what the, the idea of community care is having uh, more smaller in, uh, assisted living facilities that are set up quickly, you, they're kind of like small businesses as compared to maybe like a, maybe you all are familiar with like a company like Escaton that builds assisted living. <laughs> a little bit. So yeah, it works for Oh yeah, <laughs> one of our members. Yeah. They're, they're big around here, so I figured you guys might know them. But this is like kind of like a mom and pop shop kind of thing. Um, you know, some of them do work, but um, it's hard to regulate. There's there can be problems with that. Um, it works in certain ways, but it doesn't in others. The the state felt like this was uh, a good solution. Hopefully, it it works well going forward. Um, another. Thing that happened last year is um, AB 2483, which provides funding preferences to developers who agree to set aside units for PACE eligible individuals. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the PACE model, that's the program for all inclusive care for the elderly, which is a really good program for um, older adults who are at what the state sees as like nursing home eligibility of care. They can be eligible for this program, which basically um, is their health insurance and handles all their primary care, helps them with other sorts of community activities. It's, it's like, it very much is all inclusive. It's a great program, but it's expensive and it's very limited. Um, but it is a win when uh, it gets prioritized. It helps a lot of older adults. And then something else that happened is um, there we got funding for a healthier homes pilot, which is a model that puts a community health worker and a uh, registered nurse part-time in affordable senior housing communities. So um, as you can imagine, some older adults um, need help with various activities and managing, um, managing their insurance, managing medication, anything like that. And having more people with expertise to help them manage those things helps them stay out of skilled nursing or something like that. So um, right now there is a pilot being set up in eight counties around the state, um, and our organization, the Age California, we're consulting on that. So yeah, so this this is actually a bit more about um, the healthier homes pilot. Um, kind of, I went over it a bit already. Um, but you can see that which counties that it will be located in. Um, Yolo County is not one of them, unfortunately. 
right. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. So there we had a couple of sponsor bills that we want to get passed this year. One of them is Senate Bill 17, which is authored by Senator Caballero. Um, and essentially what SB 17 would do would be to increase the supply of affordable senior housing. So um, maybe, I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with the different kinds of affordable housing that exist, but there is um, something called senior affordable housing, which specifically is designed to serve older adults. It's age restricted, you have to be 62 or older to be able to live with them. Or some of them are actually 55 and older and others are 62 and older. It depends on what, how they're um, set up. There's various ways to fund um, these buildings. Um, so one, of, one way that affordable senior housing and affordable housing in general is built is through something called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which um, there's both, essentially what it does is it funds the building of affordable housing through um, tax credits. So uh, a developer of affordable housing can partner with a corporation that wants um, a discount on the taxes essentially and uh, basically there's an exchange that goes on where they get the funding they need along with bonds to build affordable housing. And, um, that's one of the main programs that builds affordable housing in California right now um, and affordable senior housing within that. Um, there are goals within that program for how much of that funding goes towards affordable senior housing. Uh, for the for a, for a long time, that goal has been set at 15%, which means that 15% of the tax credits, of the funds essentially, goes towards building senior projects. That, um, that is, in our opinion, not enough, which is why we introduced SB 17, which would raise that to 20%. Right now, within California, if you looked at the demographics of people who are eligible for affordable housing, more than 20% of them are older and eligible for senior housing. And um, the thing with senior housing is it, uh, it helps people stay in their home. Um, ultimately, if you put someone in a multi-age or general type of affordable housing as an older adult, eventually it's very possible that they could get uh, prematurely admitted to a skilled nursing facility or something or have a um, high hospital um, utilization that is unnecessary. Ultimately, the government is paying for that if they're on Medicare or Medicaid, that that is being paid for by the state. And it's much more expensive than just putting someone in housing that really works for them. So we, we really think this is important. As I discussed earlier, demographics point towards a much higher need for senior affordable housing. And right now it's not getting prioritized in the way that it needs to be. Um, it's kind of on the back burner as compared to other types of affordable housing. And um, we, it pulled out a, a readjustment we're setting ourselves up to go there. So this bill right now, it has passed through the Senate and is in the assembly. And we have received no opposition so far, but we did have to um, take some amendments in order to make sure that some other developers who work on affordable housing an interesting disagreement, some affordable housing developers don't necessarily believe that affordable senior housing is necessary, um, which um, I think is very blind to the, the fact that seniors have needs that are distinct from um, younger adults and really benefit from these programs. Um, but we expect it to be fairly smooth sailing, but so far this has been much more, much more challenging than we expected. So if you all want to submit a letter of support for this bill, we would definitely appreciate it. I can tell you more about that if you'd like to know. Um, another bill that we were working on, which unfortunately was held um, and was called the suspense file and won't be reconsidered until next year, um, is SB 37. Um, the reason why it's not being considered this year is because of it's a very costly program. Um, it would cost the state, uh, with the current proposal, $500 million. Essentially what it would do is create a rental assistance program for older adults 
Um, so like I was talking about earlier, it's not uncommon to have a situation where an older adult is living in, um, in an apartment for a long time and eventually the rent gets raised to a point where they can no longer live there. So the idea with this program is to uh, find the most desperate older adults. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be available to everyone that qualified, but to find the most at-risk older adults in need of rental assistance to stay in their housing and give them temporary rental assistance while working with um, housing commissions, um, housing authorities, to get them in something more permanent, like maybe uh, HUD-assisted housing or um, some other kind of affordable housing. Um, so right now, it is not being considered this year because it is a tough budget year, and um, it just became very clear fairly quickly that the this legislature and the governor were not going to prioritize it, but we are hopeful that next year will be better and we'll be able to move it forward. Something else that we're working on is very similar to the Healthier Homes Initiative, but um, is much is more comprehensive. It also uh, puts a nurse and a community health worker within affordable senior housing. Um, but it has it's based on a very tried and tested model from Vermont. The model in Vermont is called SAG, Supports and Services at Home, um, and it has been proven uh, through at least a handful of studies and pieces of research to. Um, save a lot of money on Medicare and Medicaid expenditures and things like that by helping to coordinate um, resident care and connect them with uh, their community. And so right now we're working with a handful of partners, including um, UCLA, to set up a pilot program to uh, in Los Angeles County. Um, we figure basically what we heard from the state is that this sounds like a good program, but there needs to be evidence that it works in California. And so we're in the process of figuring out how to make that work, how to get funding for this program, how to do it in a way that the state wants, and also to have an assessment that we can show that it works. And we figure that if we can make something that works in Vermont work in Los Angeles County, mm -hmm. then we can make it work in anywhere. So it's right now we're having some challenges figuring out how to get it funded. Different uh, state agencies have different ideas on how we should be doing that. Um, and they don't necessarily align very easily with what we're trying to do. There's lots, um, as you may be aware, the state puts out lots of grants for different things, a lot for nonprofit organizations to put on pilots or other types of programs and things like that. But they, they all have their own parameters, um, and none of those and none of those parameters necessarily fit what we're trying to do. And we are currently in the process where um, we've been directed by home state agencies to try and figure it out through some of these grant programs instead of getting like our own special pot of funding through either through um, a bill or some other process. So that's the stage we're at. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. A quick question on that one. So I know there's already um, federal funding. I believe it's federal for. Chronic care management, I think, rolled out with town care organizations where doctor's offices can basically have a staff person conduct phone care management meetings, um, depending on sort of the, the degree of chronic care required, mm -hmm. and get reimbursed, I think it's up to $90 a month or per patient or something like that. But there's not any sort of opportunity to capitalize on that and integrate with existing systems to get you know, get them to staff mm. these types of communities? Um, I think, I mean, there there might be a way to do that. I don't think we've looked into that particular program yet. Um, we've had a lot of luck with the state programs. Like, we've communicated a lot with the state. We have actually tried to get federal funding for this. Um, the thing is, is we really want to eventually make this a statewide program. Um, and the way that it works in Vermont that is um, very useful is uh, it has what's called an all-payer waiver. So there's lots, there's actually been lots of programs that 
we do something like put um, more nurses, community health workers, people to help um, residents who are seeing affordable housing better care for themselves, manage it, what they need to um, medically or otherwise. Um, generally, the problem is, is that they're not scalable. Maybe they're partnered with a managed care organization, a, a local health plan, and that's the only health fund in the area. So um, everyone in the affordable housing building is on the same health plan. So it's like, why, why not put uh, uh, a person there to help provide care? Because everyone there is their patient. But um, that's, not the, that's not the case in a lot of places in California. And um, generally speaking, people don't want to pay for something that they're not receiving benefit for. So how uh, SASH works and how um, California Integrated Care Home is what it's called, CH is what we call it. How that would work is both private insurance, Medicare, and Medi-Cal would all pay into a pot of money that um, funds the program. They're ultimately the ones that will benefit because you know, if someone needs to go to the hospital, they're the ones who pay. Um, so they're the ones who see the cost savings. If you had a program where the affordable housing provider had to pay for it somehow, they're, they're not seeing um, benefit from that. Just, that's just a cost that they bear um, for the good of their residents, which they care about. But um, you know, if you're relying on government, um, government reimbursements for basically everything you do, or a lot of what you do at least, it's, it makes it harder. Yeah. Yes? Could you define your, your what is your definition of affordable housing? Um, so there are a number of government funded types of affordable housing. Yeah. So, so um, one type of affordable, so there's, there's both affordable housing that mostly flows through the federal government and some that flows through the state. So um, maybe, so, at the federal level, there's um, house, uh, there's HUD, and they have um, a large portfolio of affordable housing of all different types. They have there's something called the Section 202 program, which funds the production of affordable senior housing, and those those pro those buildings that are funded through that program are for people 65 and older, or, or 62 and older. 62. Yeah, 62 and older. Sorry. For those 62 and older, and um, typically how those work is that um, as a resident, you pay a certain percentage of your income. It's 30 percent. So if you're making 10 dollars a month, you only pay three dollars. If you um, obviously you have to be considered um, lower income uh, to qualify to live in those buildings, and different ones have different income restrictions. There's there's a measure called the area median income, which is, as it sounds like, the median income of an area is calculated by um, the Census Bureau, and then they, um, if, if you have some um, some rooms in this affordable housing building that are meant to go to people who are at 50% or below, then um, they calculate what that number is, and then someone at that level um, goes there, or is always prioritized to go in that unit. Um, and so that's that's kind of a pinnacle where it's like tied to your income, how much you pay. That's the best program, it's the most secure, it's the most stable. Um, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, um, that does not come with uh, a uh, fund. The, the, the rents are not set based on someone's income. They are, they are set based on um, the, they're, they, they're generally set at a certain percentage of the, the, the what's called the fair market rent of an area, which is similar to like the area median income. They, um, I, I think HUD, they calculate what's like a typical rent for a comparable unit, and then uh, you take off. I think. I'm not exactly sure what percentage of it. It's, it's significantly more affordable than um, a, uh, a market rate unit generally, but still nowhere near as good as a hub unit. So like in the Bay Area, you could still possibly pay uh, in a low income housing tax credit uh, building like nearly $2,000 a month in rent. Yeah. 
So that's that's not really affordable to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it's affordable. Yeah. Because okay. isn't Section 202 done? No more. Uh, they they still have funding, but um, I mean, this year this year uh, I think the last few years they've been ramping it up a little bit, but this year is not going to be very good because of the it's like almost housing. nothing though, right? Um, I don't think there's going to be much of any. New and building. the housing stock is really old. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like a yeah. lot of a lot of like something that HUD yeah. does right now. I'm going to talk a bit more. Yeah. Sorry, am I taking up too much time? No, just whenever you're, I just want to, I'll, I'll link up the screen for you. Just oh, no, it's done. There's no, um, yeah, so something that HUD is doing a lot of right now is um, basically there's something um, that they are, they advocate for providers of affordable housing to do is to change the contracts of older buildings to newer ones that allow for more flexibility. So, like, as an affordable housing provider who have a contract with, the, with HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, um, you, there's certain parameters of that contract that you have to fulfill, and you're eligible for certain um, reimbursements in different ways. Maybe it's, it might be based on um, the building overall, um, or it might be uh, more like, so like um, Section 8 um, is, which you probably have all heard of, um, it funds in, by individual units. There's, there's a lot of different variations. I'm still learning all the different ones, frankly, um, getting completely familiar. But some of them are, they have benefits and detriments, all of them, but some are definitely better than others. And so something um, that, the, that HUD is with, wants people to do a lot of right now is something called, uh, what they call Brad for Brack, which is, um, there's one type of um, contract, which is a rental assistance demonstration, which is newer and allows for money for rehabilitation of older buildings. And CRAC, Project Rental Assistance Contracts, those are, um, they're, they're a little bit more rigid and it's hard as a provider of affordable housing through that to be able to fund uh, a rehabilitation project. And so for older buildings, they really are like, you should do this so that you can fund your um, your rehab. Um, so it's basically it's basically like it's it's like they're doing so it's like a scheme. Basically. Well, that's the, that's the but it's it's not like they're just giving them money. They're just they're figuring out a way to amend what exists. And and it's interesting. It's it's a bit confusing, but it it works. So there, that's like a solution to come up with. The thing with HUD is it's all based on discretionary spending for the most part, which means that there's no fixed amount each year that Congress appropriates to these programs. So um, you you can't expect there to be money necessarily in a certain year to build new Section 202 housing. That fluctuates a ton. Um, you know, all the housing providers are going to prioritize making sure they have enough money to maintain the current supply of housing. So this year, with this, with a fairly um, unfavorable budget when it comes to um, funding for various government agencies, um, I don't know if you've been following the federal news, but the big, big um, sort of negotiations surrounding the debt ceiling and the budget for next year and um, you know Republicans um, control the House and they have some leverage there and they limited um, increases in discretionary spending to like one percent increase which is not does not keep up with inflation so it's essentially a decrease which means that um, for an order for an agency like HUD that is based on discretionary spending they have they have less than they expected to have. Basically, they they have they are making adjustments to make sure they're trying to make sure people don't lose housing. They're not thinking about building more. Whereas, in, like the last few years, they have actually been building through the Section 202 program, but um, it has it hasn't been anywhere near as high as it was in the previous decades. Yeah. Well, thank you, Harrison, both for the presentation and for what you're doing in your work on this. Thank you. Our, do commissioners have any questions for clarification? That we have already just asked. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there any attitude or opinion within leading age 
about the large industry of life plan and CCRC uh, industry? Um, we have life plan and CCRC members. Um, all of our members are nonprofits. Um, a lot of our yeah, that's debatable. I mean, yeah, we had one that's, that's a nonprofit that's acting more like a for-profit, but yeah, I, that, <laughs> that's beside the point. But yeah. I just wondered if there is a particular attitude or well, we, we want about we want to figure out a way to make something long-term care affordable. So something that's kind of high in the sky right now, but has been identified in the state's master plan for aging, which you might be familiar with, is um, the need for long-term care insurance. Uh, huge, something, there, there are some like staggering statistics on uh, how much of the population will need it. Something like 80% are going to like absolutely need long-term care in some capacity, and maybe low, maybe like 10, maybe 20% of people can afford it. I'm not exactly sure about the statistics on that, but it's incredibly unaffordable. Go, going into a lot of uh, assisted living or CCRC is affordable. They, they meet the market demand for people who can afford it, and that's not really fair. There are some limited ways that people, low-income people can get into communities like that, but they are very limited at this moment. Um, and so something that we will hopefully work on in the future alongside other partners as well as the state because it has been identified in the master plan for aging already as something that is needed is long-term care insurance. That would be very expensive. It needs to be paid for some way. There might be taxes involved. People don't like taxes. Um, so it will be really challenging, but that is, that is on the horizon. And um, yes, I, mean, I, think, I think all my colleagues would agree that um, CCRCs for a lot of people are very unaffordable and that is a problem. Other questions? Well, again, thank you so much for your uh, presentation, as I said, also for the work you're doing uh, in order to get more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, and I have some business cards. If any of you um, would like it, if you want to reach out to me, please later. A what? Business cards? Oh, sure. And uh, next I should ask, is there any public comment, given that there isn't any public comment? <laughs> <laughs> There's no room for the Thank you. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. So, the, you know, the floor is open for any discussion among commissioners. I want to insert. I want to insert a comment that I noticed that you know the uh, the, uh, the one housing project, the pilot project that involves eight eight counties, not Yolo, but yes, Sacramento, and then there was the assisted living wager, a waiver pilot that involved 15 counties, including Sacramento, but not Yolo. Right. There's nothing we can do to kick Yolo in the wherever. Uh, <laughs> to get involved in these things. Well, but why? But why are we not included? Do we know it? Do we know why? Do we know why? Do we know No. Oh, overall? No. no Numbers? I, I don't know. I, I was told yesterday <coughs> that the assistant living uh, waiver that Yolo did not ask to be one of the pilots. Now that that was somebody's memory. They may not be remembering, remembering right. So yeah. a point on that, I can tell you the assisted living waiver program is not appealing to providers. It's not what, sorry? It's not appealing to assisted living providers. Mm. It increases the burden in reporting. It pays far less than market rates. Like providers don't want to participate. <coughs> And so it, yeah. the, the program needs to be modified to make it actually, you know, it, it needs to be appealing to both sides. Or else you're going to wind up with a separate class of yeah, yeah. kind of ALW only buildings, which are sort of like, you know, the Medical only skilled nursing, which oh, have their downsides. That's a good point. Wow. I, I am really very concerned. I mean, our, I just see my neighbors, my neighbors who are getting priced out and, and they have nowhere to go. I mean, they literally have no place to go. 
Uh, we had one person uh, who couldn't afford the rent increases, and um, she is in affordable housing in, in Sacramento, but her release is up. And she's waiting to come back to Davis. But meanwhile, she's going to be living out of a van. Mm -hmm. So she becomes somebody who is, I guess, technically unhoused. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know where we go from there because we're not. Our increases aren't as bad as some of the assist, the um, independent living places. I'm sorry, you guys. Wow, your increases are beyond. <laughs> Uh, most people's income is just yeah, not possible. You know, I think probably all of us agree, and the data says that affordability or affordable housing for the growing older adult population, and certainly in the country and in California, and I suspect it's equally true in Davis, where actually the percentage of non UC Davis population that is older is, is higher than the national average. Is that right? Uh, that this is a real problem. Now what what this commission can contribute to dealing with that, I have no idea. Well, we need to advocate for more housing. I mean, we, we need it. Yeah. More affordable housing for yeah, seniors. Yeah, so you say not just more housing. We well, need, we need we don't right. need more, you know, one and a half million dollar houses. No, we seniors. need more affordable housing for seniors, and we need to figure out how to uh, uh, assist people. I mean, I don't know how you do it. How do you assist people who are already in housing to make their rent? Right. Well, I'm hearing a lot of like, how do we do it? What do we do? Questions, and this is, I think, a good opportunity to try to convert some of these concerns into um, research questions um, and to think about what is the, the piece of, um, what would the report look like that, that we, we could potentially collectively work on um, and develop to, to determine, to identify known and successful responses to this type of problem for a community of our size and type. Well, it'd be multifaceted. Yes, it would, and it would probably take some time to do. Sorry, what? It would probably take some time to do. Oh, I would think so. Yeah. yeah. The one you talk about as, as research, you also wonder if there's any way to involve this big research institution that's nearby <laughs> uh, in looking into this sort of thing. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so speaking uh, of affordable housing and supply, it, am I crazy or did the Bretton Woods project when it first came up contemplate doing a lot more affordable housing? I thought it, it started out with like 200 or 300 units. It's, it's, now it's down to 90 something. They have an apartment building of 150 units. It's 150 units, right? 150. Is it? But right. that's but that's all. Mm -hmm. But I but I thought that was what they originally said. Is that what? I, I was thinking it was a lot larger originally. I could be wrong. I mean, that's been on for what now? Five years? Yeah, really. At least. So I could I could I could find the original presentation um, documents to see what that is. Well, how that changed. Where is that whole project going anyway? Well, Mercy House is still trying to get yeah. the tax credit yeah. kind of coverage in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, wait, just, just for context, not really relevant to the project or anything in Davis, but Escaton had partnered with Mercy Housing to try and build new affordable housing in Roseville. And we wow. had, I think it was seven or eight acres or something that we donated to the project. That's been outstanding for four years, five years, and haven't been able to get funding for it. And finally, we just said, you know what? We're not even going to be general partners anymore. Here's the land. You can have the land, and we're just going to go work on other stuff. Oh. Because it's, we, even though you know we have a total of 23 different affordable housing communities around the state, um, it, it, it's not worth it to go through this, the tax credit development process, mm -hmm. because you get like points based on all these really fine-tuned criteria. You like try to tweak what the partnership ratios are in order to get more tax credit points. And, and you lose money basically over those five years by not doing something. Yeah. 
right? And so it's it's just not working. Yeah. If if we could just pay money and develop it, we'd pay money and develop it, but it's but that doesn't work either. Well, the the two hundred two funding, which used to be like that's how we built all of ours, the ones that we built ourselves. Like you said, Lisa is pretty much gone. And it's a, there's a tiny bit here and there, but it's just it's not a functional program anymore. So now only ultra specialized developers who know how to play the games with this tax credit it's system actually build. And so it's only a few really large companies that are building new affordable housing, and that of course creates its own set. Yeah, and I problems. recall when the Mercy. Uh, folks gave a presentation on the Bretton Woods affordable housing part that they were, if I'm remembering right, they seemed fairly confident about the money to build the first building yes. with half the units yes, and then hoped they would be able to find the money right. to build the second half and mentioned the same kind of problem you were just saying. Yep. Uh, well, one of the things that I had mentioned to uh, social services was the um, university donating property. You see Davis has the largest um, uh, land mass, the largest land. Maybe Merced is second, but that's a new, creating a new campus, but creating a land trust. And that, um, because they can actually do it if they want to. I sent um, Commissioner Breitbach um, an article I was reading, and I was truly floored about uh, the issues with affordable housing. And I don't know if all of you or some of you heard of BlackRock. Mm -hmm. They're buying up everything. And you see the, the, the regions were considering investing my four billion dollars into black rock. And so I thought, well see there you are. Because they already have a five billion dollar real estate portfolio that they already have invested in then. And so I thought, well if they're going to invest that kind of money that's coming from the students, they can certainly set aside some property for student housing and mixed income and um, just creating a land trust. Some cities have that and, um, and unfortunately there is the story that you just gave and it was like, there are so many of those, there are so many of those and just imagine the ones that we don't hear about. <coughs> You know, because people see people and they say homeless or downtown. I think that people don't remember, but at one time they had a home. These people had a home. And something happened, you know. But uh, it is a growing trend with veterans and the elderly are the two fastest growing populations that are becoming unhoused in this time. And that's really unacceptable for a nation as well. Right. It was clear <laughs> that uh, <clears throat> our work plan already says senior house and that we want to keep it there and maybe put an affordable adjective in there as well. Uh, I think the term is going back to housing insecurity. It, well, because if you say, yeah. because that covers a whole yeah. lot of... Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's, just not, it's not reaching the lowest, necessarily. Right. right. Although, I guess we should not have as big a concern for about senior housing for relatively wealthy people. But, uh, we, but nonetheless, insecurity is the issue. If you're right. Let, if, if we can, uh, let's move on uh, to the off-site meeting outreach efforts yeah. and see if we can get at least a little bit of the, the work plan issue uh, after that. And one thing I hope is perhaps at our next meeting, work plan should be the number one thing we attack and not end up with getting to it after we've done 
you know, a, I thought a very interesting presentation, but still, let's focus on that. Let's get to the work plan for sure. Our next meeting, though, is September, well, right? Well, that's, that's one of the things we want to address, hopefully, quickly, uh, is perhaps we uh, do not meet in July since Maria is out of the country, but do meet in August instead. But oh. we'll address that at the at the end. So uh, <clears throat> on the offsite meeting outreach, uh, well, Maria, you want to tell us? Yeah, about Yolo Cares there? Galileo Place mm -hmm. would be pleased to host us. We had talked about the fall; uh, they can do it as early as August. But if we prefer to defer to October 10th. Um, that would be fine. Honestly, they, they are completely flexible and, and, um, and um, would gladly welcome us. So this will be a public meeting, so we'll advertise it, um, e-notifications, the agenda, and additional outreach we were talking about. Um, yeah, and so, so basically they are, they are happy to host you. Is, is and it's to be, it would be a, a meeting like this meeting, a formal yeah, right. meeting, and we, before that time we'd have to decide what particularly do we want to do there that seems especially appropriate for there? We don't have to decide that now, but... But uh, it's possible after our meeting an optional thing would be a tour. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. Oh, right. absolutely. I mean, I, I would think, you know, absolutely. the optional part of the meeting. Yeah. We adjourn and... Adjourn, yeah. Right. So, so business of the meeting can... can manifest in many ways. If we went to a community that had issues that they wanted us to hear about, then it would just be an open kind of forum. The highlights, um, PowerPoint is helpful. Having some kind of work plan structure framework so they kind of see the types of things that we kind of weigh in on and, and, and advocate for um, is helpful. And then just open it to the public. Um, if, if we wanted to work on the work plan a little bit at Galileo Place so they could kind of see the workings of, of you know, uh, if, if we're working on that in October and that's what we want to see. So, so we can have a regular meeting. We can also bring, bring in a, a presenter if we thought that could be helpful or relevant. Like at Rancho Yolo, we brought in the presenter, Dr. Patrick Garbour. Right. Mm -hmm. That made sense. Um, and so it could be however, however the commission wants to um, navigate that. I, I wonder, if, uh, are there two or three commissioners, perhaps including Elizabeth, I'm volunteering you, that would like to work on trying to formulate what would be a good thing to do at that meeting? I'm happy to do that. Anybody else want to participate with her? And I'll help you. I've got all the outlines from previous, okay. and so. I've already taken the tour, and I've already worked with them. I'm I'm happy is, to it, is it possible some don't know what hospice is? Would it be as simple as that? No. Well, it's not just hospice, though. No, but that was the first thing that came up. We Googled it. Oh, uh, well. They anyway, have, we, we can talk. Well, right. Can I ask, it, actually, um, there had been some talk about wanting us wanting to, um, to really uh, build out the community outreach way in which we function of our commission and focus on the off-site meetings, the function, primary function of the off-site meetings being a way to um, not just create more visibility about what we do, but to facilitate the, the us hearing from the public what their concerns and priorities are. Um, and Jim, you had worked on the slideshow, I believe, for that purpose. Yeah, not necessarily a formal meeting of this mm -hmm. group, right. but a presentation that one person does to somebody. That's right. The, 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 that was how I was envisioning when the slideshow that you created was right. to um, uh, to really facilitate a, a meaningful discussion and to, to encourage um, input, community input that could that would then come to us. Um, and so, it, is that not the? I'd like to really try to for us to focus on these offsite meetings 
with that function. The well, only thing I'd do is distinguish off-site meeting sounds like a meeting of this body as opposed to a presentation someplace. Okay? And so, because we're not going to try to get this body to meet every month at a different right. place. So, maybe it's a misnomer then. Perhaps what we're talking about is a community forum, a Senior Citizen Commission community forum to be held at Galileo Place. That was not what I thought we were doing, so I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, what I, I'm sorry, I probably got us going the wrong way here. So I think that in October, what we're talking about is a meeting like this meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the issue is, and what specifically do we want to have happen at that mm -hmm. meeting? And then a separate thing is uh, we've been working on putting together a slideshow presentation that can be at a variety of places, not as a meeting of this committee, but as less than three people, probably <laughs> one, uh, going and giving that presentation. And Leilani had put together great uh, input stimulating questions that are at the tail end of that. So that's a different thing. But uh, is anybody else going to offer to uh, work with Elizabeth on trying to formulate what we would try to actually do as a formal meeting at, uh, in October? Can I ask two sure. questions related to that? One is, why are we talking about October? And not September or August. I, I, I so that we jump to October. The <laughs> that we talk about. It's too well, are we going to have an August meeting, but it's too hot at Galileo? That was what people thought last time. Oh, I didn't. I didn't get that. Either. It was just one of the feedback from commissioners was like, you know, for the tour and viewing the gardens, but maybe um, two thirty would be a little I bit see. uncomfortable. Okay. So yeah. we're, but we're, we're oh, but I mean, the meeting of course is going to be indoors. So Climate controlled. It's just a matter of, uh, and so that's why I just wanted to put it out there that they be available as early as August. Okay. This and related to that, it seems to me we could incorporate what Leilani is talking about. If we were to be discussing, if we discuss our our work plan, we can be discussing what should be in the work plan, and we can be asking people who are attending the meeting. You heard our outline of the of the. And we're now opening it for discussion among commissioners, but we're asking for input of what what you think should be part of the commission's work. Yeah, precisely that is in, among the questions that Leilani suggested that we yep. and, and I, try to get. I think that one of the problems might be getting enough people there to make that happen. Yeah. So we definitely. really have to have some good advertising. Some yeah. build up. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. but if all we're so the work plan, I'm workshopping the work plan in a more public environment <laughs> than this, um, I think uh, it's use of the, the important thing is we're, we're opening the door, we're creating a venue for, for um, people to give input. But I feel doubtful about how actually how useful that, that it would be. Um, what I think a more um, the, the business of our commission meetings, I think, is not, it's not that accessible, <laughs> immediately accessible mm -hmm. to the public, and much of it is sort of the, uh, the, the workings of what we do together is, um, it feels uh, like a bit of an internal process. Obviously, we are a public body, but it it's not, I I'm, I'm feel a little concerned about, about how useful it would be to just simply be doing it in front of others mm -hmm. um, without more guidance or structure or facilitation. So what I would think is would be a better flow for making sure that we get really good and um, authentic, purposeful feedback from the public and input from the public that informs our work plan is that if, let's say we have three community forums over the course of the next nine months, mm -hmm. right? Or we have four community forums, and ideally, I think it would be very useful to hire a facilitator, or we could find someone pro bono, or they could train us. Mm -hmm. But that this would be designed to really facilitate input from the public. And then the, 
gathered information that we receive then informs the work plan workshopping process that we embark on starting in February of 2024, ending with a final you know, uh, decision and, and workup of our work plan in May, let's say. Just you know, giving us those months to gather, workshop, and then I think that kind of a timeline is a timeline that would be um, that would really give a chance to get uh, strong community um, engagement, and and in the meantime, our these the con the concept of the offsite meeting, I just feel is is it's it's not quite all the way there in terms of community engagement. It's just simply us doing this in front of others. <laughs> So historically, the offsite meetings have usually been tied to some topic of interest to members of the public. Uh, we did one at Rancho Yolo where we had a brief meeting covering commission business and then went into the presentation by the doctor. Dr. Patrick Arbour. Yeah. Institute right. of Aging. Right. Yeah. And so on, you know, uh, isolation, loneliness, and suicide prevention. And there was another one, I don't I don't remember what the topic. How many? How many? Yeah. But it's it's so yes, it is commission business, but part of the commission business is stuff that's very much of public interest. And so the, I think the idea behind uh, you know, someone taking on figuring out what we want to agendize for that is really about picking the right stuff to do, hopefully with a substantial group of the public, uh, rather than, you know, nuances or asking for like that that probably wouldn't be a time where we We'd ask for detailed staff updates on some other project. It would right. probably be something more. Right, but the people who are who are in attendance at um, Galileo Place, the people who are actually there, are uh, people who are in um, adult daycare. So um, they're in varying degrees of. So their caregivers could be uh, <laughs> their caregivers could likely be there, and and so uh, and they are themselves in varying degrees of mental awareness. You know, a really uh, good topic would be then if if um, building on that. Remember, we had the nursing home person come yeah. and talk about different ways to think about affording mm -hmm. long term care because. Mm -hmm. This is a segue, right? Perhaps. Well, they are really there during the day. Well, so the people, the, the staff who are there, I mean, they they will work with people to come up with a, a, a plan to pay for the daycare program, for the day, right. but not the broader. No, no. no. that's what she's saying. No, yeah. well, that was just one. So, yeah. well, because there are people, there are staff people there, yeah, who are are very well. So they could right. prevent. And they could they could participate perhaps mm -hmm. in a discussion or whatever. Uh, I'm just throwing that out that they themselves are are quite knowledgeable. We are we are also trying to learn from them, right? Mm -hmm. Another option might be uh, see if someone from area agency of aging or something can come and talk about resources that are available to caregivers mm -hmm. oh. for their loved ones. So, you know, things like the respite programs mm -hmm. that are out there mm -hmm. and right. IHSS and other things like that, you know, just resources to help improve quality of life of both the older adults who are dependent and those who are providing care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it seems to me that the way to structure the meeting would be to be sure that, yes, we have to approve the minutes of the preceding meeting, we have to call the roll, then if we can find a presentation that is should be of interest to that audience and then you know we have the next thing is is there any public comment well what we want to do then mm -hmm. is all the rest of the meeting should yes. be right interaction with whether it's caregivers or caretakers or and we, would, we would encourage yellow uh 
Galileo place to reach out to the actual caregivers. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We would have right. them reach out to the caregivers who are getting respite. Yeah, the because families of the clients. Exactly. Really exactly. For. exactly. So we yeah. have to have, I think that is going to be our audience. We're going to need October then, because if we're off in July, we're going to need to work on this in August in order right. to, and we could have it in September. But we wouldn't want it in August because basically we'd be planning there would be no revision review. I, I could schedule a meeting in July. Janet Cheney would be available if we just wanted to go, you know, without pause during the summer. But, but I, so, think, I, I think what we want to make sure is we don't have any other agenda items that we got right. through that. Right, right, We've right. got the things that we absolutely have to do. Right. And then a good presentation. Uh, and chances are there would be some discussions among us I mean, or questions and so on, and then public comment, and that would be the rest of the meeting. Right, mm -hmm. but I think September we're, we're probably going to want to spend a lot of time on our work plan, mm -hmm. right? So then we would meet in August as opposed to July? Correct. Mm -hmm. if, if, the, if the commission is okay with that or doesn't bother you. Now before... Let, let me just kind of make oh. a quick jump here since we were just talking about that before Carol has the part. Oh, well, no, my Carol oh, is coming. Uh, <laughs> but they're not supposed to be here till 4.30, right? right. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the idea is to say not meet in July, but do meet on August the 10th, which would be the date, uh, <clears throat> if that's acceptable. We don't care if it's acceptable to Tom. <laughs> does anybody, no objection. Does anybody have but you do problem? have to show up to the meeting we have on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, right. Show up to the non meeting in July. Right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that. We will not meet in July. Okay. And we will meet on what would be the normal date, which I believe is August uh, 10th. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's a regular meeting here. Correct. And then October, we're going to be Galileo. September, <laughs> remember, we're meeting at our new start time. That's when we decide. Oh, oh right, at 1 o'clock. We're going to need Correct. a lot of reminding. We will oh, be, oh, I'll oh, be reminding. Oh, we'll meet in August yes, and yeah. remind you next month we're meeting an hour and a half. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. And yeah. what is the deadline on our work plan drafting process? I asked about that, Leilani. <laughs> so, um, guidance from the city manager's office was there wasn't necessarily it, the you can determine what you want. You know, the in in light of um, council member Vitla and their pro, you know, basically their retreat and what they're looking at. I mean, we can revise the work plan and adopt a work plan and then revise it again with new information. So. You know, you had mentioned kind of this longer range forum where we can work with this existing draft, make some revisions, but then really gather public input and and work on establishing these forums. So, you know, if we want to do that and make it a five month process, is whatever the commission wants. But there's no hard fast rule on oh, this needs to be adopted for January for the year. But also, I don't know that the rest of the commission um, received this information, but I had. I did let our chair and vice chair know about the city council goals and objectives that are currently on record. Um, it's a 17-page document that is from that goes from the term 2021 through 2023. So presumably, I don't know how like relevant this document is, but it re it represents it articulates six goals that the city had identified and that they're working on peppered with specific objectives and initiatives that and, and like ways to achieve these and I'm, I'm aware that the Social Services Commission has when they were have re done their work plan that they examined the city goals and objectives and then tr found points of convergence um, to you know that to support that that the joint work um, and that that informed their process of identifying their focus for their work plan. And I'd really like to propose that for us, that, that e even though these current goals will be changing and being updated in this next period, 
but this is as far as we know what the city has identified as what is important to them. And you'll see as you go through it that several of them have pertained to, to our commission's subject area. And um, I think it may be useful, I'd like to add, encourage all, all of us to read it carefully and, and really think through um, that converge, those points of convergence as we think about identifying identifying the work plan. Because some of it, the city's already done, so we can leap from. Can from. Mm -hmm. you send us a link to that? Or I'll send the link. To I will. Oh, okay. I'll send the link, and then I'll also send the link to the senior the, the Social Services Commission work plan, which they have updated for 2023. And Maria said that she you would send us also any of the current work plans for all the other commissions. Yeah, I think bicycle really transportation useful. and safety doesn't have one. Some commissions do, some don't. Yeah. I think it just doesn't matter. But I'll send you what we have. As a matter of interest and reference, I just I think it'd be really useful yeah. for us to see that. I, the only thing is, I guess I, I find it well. Social services I see has a lot of connections. Not clear to me that you know three commissions, so, <laughs> yeah. some other things. So. I think if we'll we also think there. about the work plan as a vehicle for a, like was this, this, the piece of communication between us and the city council, if we think about it like that, mm -hmm. then we can think about how useful it is to just glance upon other work, other commissions' um, ways that they're articulating this relationship. Yeah. All right. Uh, <coughs> so we. Sort of been talking about work plan issues, but not actually the work plan document itself. Uh, <clears throat> you want to talk about that for a bit and some of the items that are on it? I don't know, it's almost 4 30. Right? So it's it's be good. Good. We, I mean, if we choose to start on it, we have the right to go on, but that's, that's why I'm asking the question. It's last day of school, so. Pardon me? It's last day of school, so I don't want to be yeah. too late getting. My kids. Mm -hmm. no. All right. Let, let me ask one thing about this, uh, and that is, how do you want? How should we proceed in July, uh, where we're really going to focus on work plan? Do we want to look at? Well, look at the first thing here. Do we want to continue to say that, or do we want to say something different? Do we want, and then are there things we want to add? You know, how do you want to proceed? I want Leilani's comment about going through the city council's priorities that they've already stated and working from that to look at our our work plan and see that they align yes yeah i think we start with that and providing all the work plans so you have that as a working document just to kind of see what other commissions are doing there's a not there's a fair amount of work that we can do i believe on this work that we're totally have permission to do over email, where we're passing drafts back and forth, or you know, I could give you a list of the city council goals that I think, you know, might like to flag that I've flagged that I think are relevant. But there's there's some, a lot of that work I think would be very efficient to do over email, and then by the time our August meeting arrives, we'll have something we can then. Decide. Do you want to establish a subcommittee? Do you want everybody providing feedback, or would you? I think everybody should oh, provide feedback. Right up. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sorry. I don't mean it that way. I wasn't considered. I wasn't. Right, right. No, just in terms of work. Right. Yeah. Just, just in terms of like content coming. Bye, Carol. Bye, Bye Carol. Bye. Um, Jim, do you have an opinion about about how to help? Because I don't want to turn it into violations conscience. with with that, right. you know, right. things right. coming back and forth because it's an agenda item. Right. Whereas if, if if there's a hub of a subcommittee and everybody kind of feeds into that, then those, you know, the subcommittee can kind of form from that input. Yeah. You think that, that it would be a brown act violation to... To go back and forth and work on a work plan work because plan. it's agendized. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It says what? Uh, what do they call it? A sequential meeting or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Daisy. Um, yeah. 
It would, well, I don't know if that's it actually, but yes, I, I, it would be a brown eye violation to work on, to work on this um, with the broader group. But it wouldn't be for two or three people to work together. Oh, uh, it has to be less than your, I think it's less than a form. Okay. Um, should I make a motion? Why don't we do that? Let's make a subcommittee. Can okay. I be on it? Of course. <laughs> Hi. I mean, yes. <laughs> okay. Who will join me? <laughs> Come on, you know you want to spend you your summer think about it. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, not I. Right. <laughs> not you, darn it. Oh. Yeah, I'll, jo I'll join you. You will chair it. That okay. sounds good. <laughs> okay. okay. Agreed. <laughs> Me and Jim. Uh, well, I don't know if we actually have to have a motion to create a motion move. <laughs> yeah, motion move to uh, create a subcommittee to work on the work plan. I'll second that. Okay. okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Uh, and. I guess that is, uh, that is it. Uh, we are at two hours and we're not in the midst of something else. So uh, <laughs> I will <laughs> say one more thanks to Tom for his yeah. seven, Yes, Tom. Um, yeah. Long time. Long For 7.3 years. Or <laughs> I read that you up to eight, but I'm the social worker. I should never do that. <laughs> so uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good meeting. Yeah, it's been a fun